All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Checking in, checking in. Can you hear me? Can't, can, can you? Check, check. Can you guys hear me? Hear me? All right, welcome to another episode of Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard. I am here from Las Vegas in the Luxor Hotel on the Strip. I can actually see Allegiant Stadium outside my window where the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers will play each other in the Super Bowl on Sunday. I uh, was on Radio Row today talking to players, talking to fellow media members, people around the league. Um, Obviously, the busy week for the Giants, hiring Shane Bowen, defensive coordinator, finally hiring a new defensive coordinator to replace Wink Martindale after a four-week search. We will get to that and explain what I think of that. I see all the questions in the queue already. Rick, Hunter, and Kenny all in the chat, so let's go. Rick Bowman says, Screwball Thursday is back. That is right, Rick. No screwball in my hand right now. But as I always say, we're working on them. Screwball, time to get on board. Get on board the train before the Talking Ball podcast um, has left the station. Uh, All right. So Rick says, regarding the promotions, are there real changes in operational responsibilities for Kafka, Tierney, and or Henderson? So, We're talking Giants tonight. We're talking NFL. We're talking Super Bowl, whatever you guys want to discuss. But we're going to start with Rick's question, a good question about uh, the Giants so-called promotions for their coach, for their coaches, Mike Kafka, Shea Tierney and Jerome Henderson. So what this is, is the Giants have a problem. And the problem is that they have lost eight coaches from Brian Dable's staff, either through firings or through uh, coaches just leaving of their own accord. Oh, I see Joel. I see Jim. I see Joe. I see Michael. I see Mark. We're all here and we are rolling. Sounds good. So Rick, I think one thing needs to be said about these so-called promotions. Mike Kafka and Shea Tierney, and listen, they worked hard, but they worked on the 30th ranked offense in the NFL. Okay, the giant. This was one of the worst offenses in Giants history. So are they getting promotions? Okay, so they're getting extra titles. Presumably they're getting more money. But really, and again, this is not to be negative, but just to clarify what the big picture is here in the context. This is the Giants trying to smooth over an incredibly rocky start to the 2024 year by um, tabbing these coaches with these additional titles. So it's welcoming welcoming them back in, right? Think of Brian Dable giving the game ball to Wink Martindale when we all know now what was really happening behind the scenes. The promotion for Mike Kafka could be seen a lot like that, right? Um, Mike Kafka was blocked by the Giants from leaving and taking that San Francisco, or I'm sorry, the Seattle Seahawks interview for the offensive coordinator position. And, you know, it was expected that if he got that interview, he was going to take the job. And so blocking Mike Kafka there, the Giants turn around and they block him, but they also presumably give him more money. They give him this extra assistant head coach title. And so really that's a way to protect the team optically by making sure they're not losing a third coordinator and the house of cards doesn't collapse. And then they are paying Mike Kafka with title, with money, presumably, to come back into the fold and be a part of this. Now, here's something, Rick, I think that's important. Um, 
Mike Kafka is expected to have play calling taken away from him this season completely. So is it really a promotion if they're giving him an assistant head coach title and a little bit more money, but they're robbing him of those responsibilities that he would really want to have in order to continue to build his resume to being a head coach, right? So you're stripping him of one thing while giving him another is what that would be if they actually take it away. As far as are there real operational changes, Rick, I would think that while, like, let's say Kafka has play calling taken away, they'll probably give him certain responsibilities around crafting things about the game day operation that they can say are extra. Uh, Jerome Henderson, Shea Tierney, you know, I would think that they'll get a little bit more involved in certain parts of game planning and Brian Dable is going to make it more quote unquote collaborative, right? but all underneath the umbrella of him as the head coach and everybody answering to him. And I think the, I think what it's important for fans to understand is that these promotions for these, these uh, select coaches who stayed on was more about optics than anything else. And that is not a negative comment. It's just a comment about somebody who's close to the situation. Me, me, myself, who understands what's going on. Okay. Uh, Hunter says, good evening, Pat. Be 100% transparent with us. How is this new defensive coordinator, Shane Bowen? So, Hunter, uh, I I did not comment a ton on Shane Bowen right off the bat. And that's a great question. And Rick, thanks for kicking us off there. And Hunter, thanks for kicking us off. And remember, guys, here at Talking Ball, uh, Pat Leonard, YouTube channel, podcast, uh, please hit the like button while we are live. That helps us create engagement. Please subscribe if you don't already. Please buy some super chats and super stickers. Get your comment elevated to the top of the chat when it starts getting crowded. It supports us. It gets your comment and your opinion answered and addressed immediately. Really appreciate that. And really just need to tell you quickly about Bet Online. And then Hunter will get right into that. The big game is finally here. Bet Online is your number one source for playoff football odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of player performance props. With dozens of odds, props, and info on hundreds of sports, events, politics, and entertainment, you can access the world's best wagering information anytime from desktop or your mobile devices. Head to the BetOnline app today to stay updated on all the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, so Hunter, Shane Bowen, I didn't comment on it right away because I have to be honest, I didn't know a ton about him. And frankly, the AFC set, listen, the, ti- the Titans were the last place team in the AFC South. Rating their coaching staff isn't exactly the first thing I would think of when I, when I would say, hey, time for the Giants to get better. What do we do? But Bowen um, has a good reputation for stopping the run and for running some creative blitzes. So the major difference is that he's going to play a lot more zone than Martindale does. Um, 71% of the time played zone versus 55% for Martindale last season. And, you know, the run defense much better last year for the Titans than the Giants. Um, the Giants rush defense last year, 4.7 yards per carry, 24 rushing TDs allowed. The Titans, 3.8 rushing, uh, yards per carry and only 10 rushing touchdowns allowed. So you look at that. You have to say, listen, if we're going to get any improvement right now, if we're going to get any improvement from Shane Bowen, the defensive coordinator, it's going to have to start on the run defense side. Now, I think you guys would agree with me that personnel means a lot there, right? Because, you know, there were times in uh, 2022 when Martindale's defense would stop the run, right? And there were times that the Giants – Defense could stop the run even this past season, except what happened too was they didn't score on offense. And so they were often behind and the other team was running the ball and it wasn't obvious passing situations where the Giants defense could pin their ears back, rush the passer, right? So those game situations, they affect you. That's important. Um, So with that said, Shane Bowen has a good reputation for stopping the run. The Titans have been basically the best run defense in the NFL over the course of the past three years. They've been consistent. Again, it happened when better personnel came in. Like 2020, he was the play caller, even though he was the linebackers coach. 
And um, the next year they got better when they got better players. Danico Autry got signed as a defensive end free agent signing. And off we go. Uh, other things happened. Some young players got better. They added some other free agents as well. But the Giants are in a position now where, let's just be honest, guys. Like they traded Leonard Williams away. They got that extra second round pick. That's a valuable thing, right? So, you know, I, I like that Joe Shane did that, frankly, with where the season was at. But you have to replace a Leonard Williams on the defensive line. You have to get that defensive end. You have to, um, frankly, I think even though Bobby O'Karake was excellent last year and Micah McFadden came on, McFadden did miss some tackles down the stretch of the season. I do think you can't ignore the depth and the quality of the inside linebacker position if you want to play this defense. You need corners who are willing and able to tackle. Like Deontay Banks is is willing. I think he needs to get better at actually doing it. I think he did during the second half of the season. That's a work in progress on the run stopping end. And then I think with the Dory Jackson likely gone, you need a corner on the other side who can tackle. And you need an edge rusher on the other side of Kayvon Thibodeau who sets the edge, plays the run well. And you need Kayvon to get better at that as well. Honestly, he was better as a run setter and an edge setter in the in his rookie season than he was this past year. So those are a lot of things to ask personnel-wise that don't all fall on Bowen, and a lot of it doesn't fall on Bowen there. That falls on Joe Shane. Um, so, you know, Hunter, I think when you say 100% transparent about what this means, I do think Bowen needs more players. Now, that said, now, listen, I know that – Different people fall on different sides of the Martindale, Dayball, Giants, all that, that discussion of who's in the wrong and who left who and all that. But bottom line, listen, bottom line is this. Martindale had a ton of success with the Ravens. They were the second, third, and second scoring defense for three years running with him as their defensive coordinator. Um, and they got some playmaking last year on the Giants defense that the Titans – didn't get anything close to like, for example, Martindale's giants had 31 takeaways and scored three touchdowns last year. The Titans under Bowen last year had 14 takeaways. So that's less than half of the giants and only one touchdown. So you got run stopping and the Titans did give up about two points less, fewer per game or a little more than two points fewer per game than the giants. But the giants defense also was, creating plays, making plays, forcing turnovers, um, keeping the team in the game maybe a little bit longer when the offense was struggling. I do think that, you know, I know Brian Dable loves to talk about complimentary football. I think he, they actually need to do it. Like I think the offense needs to support the defense. Like Brian Dable's here and John Mara will tell you this. Like he'll say it openly. Like they have been searching far and wide for somebody who can make them a modern offense. And obviously they haven't necessarily picked the right people or like even in Pat Shermer's case, the offense was actually did some good things, but there were other things he didn't do well as a head coach. They just can't seem to get that right. But Brian Dable, he's here to be the head coach, but also was here to get the offense right. And if you can get the offense competent, you can get the line competent. You can help to complement the defense and not force it to be desperate, right? and not force the defense to feel like it has to make a huge play just to keep your team in the game. Uh, but, but Hunter, here's what I can tell you about Shane Bowen, and then I'll move on to the next question. But it, this is, I think, something I wanted to talk about because I really did do a lot of work, research, made some phone calls, talked to people about what this would mean for the Giants. Zone-heavy scheme, yes, 3-4 based, um, the emphasis is on playing, you know, downhill, playing fast, strike at the point of attack, concentrate on stopping the run, add some creative uh, blitz packages and pressures into it. Uh, like I talked to some sources about how Bowen will use some odd fronts to confuse the offense, tries to spread out the offensive line to some um, wide sets and then create some one on one mismatches where they can make some splash plays, get some guys to the quarterback. Also simulates pressures, sends, you know, shows one thing and then brings another guy, something that Martindale does as well. Um, so there are some similarities, but a lot of differences. Hunter, I would say this. 
the assumption, any assumption that Bowen is going to help them improve over Martindale, I think would be a silly assumption to make in and of itself, just based on the quality of coach that Martindale was and is and Bowen 37. I mean, he's still young. Now that said, he did show some really good things in Tennessee. They stopped the run, which is something that John Mara and Joe Shane tried to do last year with their personnel additions. And the giants got, you know, we're not good at stopping the run again. Right. Um, so I think there are signs of what Brian Dable wants from a defensive coordinator in Shane Bowen, even though he wasn't the first, co- the first choice. And if you look at the coaching tree, it goes Shane Bowen connected to Mike Vrabel, connected to Dean Pease, connected to Bill Belichick and Belichick, Vrabel, Pease. Like, those are all guys that Brian Dable has a connection to and a familiarity with. So I think even looking back at Pat Graham, who was here and who was the guy that Brian Dable is going to bring on and keep on from Joe Judge's staff until Graham said he wanted out, left, went to the Raiders. You can see that Dable now gets a guy who runs something that he's more familiar with and comfortable with because of his history of coaching under the Bill Belichick Patriot tree. Now that said, Martindale's two minute defense was much better under the giant with the giants in these last two years than Bowen's Titans defense has been. And then Graham's giants defense was so there's some give, there's going to be some give and take. There might be some improvements here, but also some, some gives in other places. Rick says my favorite line in your article today was personnel matters. What personnel changes do you expect on the defensive side with Bowen on board? Yeah, Rick, I think that Leonard, I would look is primarily at the Leonard Williams spot, like vacated by him. Like obviously they had a Sean Robinson, Raheem known as Roches, Nacho, et cetera. But you know, the young guys like the Jordan Riley's, the DJ Davidson's like, to me, they need some more dogs up front like that, you know, to play what Bowen plays, like they need some more guys like that, like that to me, you know, and even I, again, like Mike McFadden, he came on stronger this year, but to me, you can't ignore, you can't look at inside linebacker and say, we are set. You cannot do that. If you're Joe Shane here, Uh, you know, I don't know who you're bringing in there right now, but you have to reinforce that you need good tacklers. You need downhill players who can stop the ball, stop the play, and force the next down. Because you're playing a lot of zone, you're keeping the ball in front of you, um, and you're emphasizing strong tackling, strong technique. Um, you know, in, in some cases, maybe like bend but don't break type deal. So I think – up front, that defensive end position in the 3-4, so it's like, you know, next to Dexter Lawrence. I think uh, somebody there. I think uh, some reinforcement at inside linebacker. And the other corner position, I think, is big as well. Of course, you have Xavier McKinney. Are they going to resign him? Are they not? Uh, what's going to happen with him? So that's something also to monitor. All right. Michael says, good evening. What's up, Michael? Good to see you, man. Joe says, hey, Pat, Giants fan here. Thanks for your live streams and your honest reporting for the Giants. Joe, thanks for being here and thanks for supporting us. Really appreciate it, man. Let me know if you have a question. Thank you for the compliment, though. It does mean a lot. Mark says he missed a few shows. He's here tonight. All good, Mark. I was a few minutes late tonight, but uh, I'm here and you guys hung on strong. And, you know, that happens – Unfortunately, that's been happening a lot with me. And obviously, when you do this, you know, it's funny, like, as you as we go, you know, eventually, hopefully it gets we get big enough, we build this, we end up with producers and a schedule and, um, you know, something, something more official. But um, in my role, I'm doing it all. So I'm posting on social media, texting and calling people arranging interviews, arranging podcasts, scheduling these, posting on social media to advertise it. You know, it's like one thing after another. And then when I'm in Las Vegas for the Super Bowl, I'm pressing the flesh, shaking hands, uh, talking to people, networking, connecting, um, you know, doing all that. And so, you know, what happened here was I was down on the casino floor 
running into some good folks, running into some of the good people at Believe who are building something strong at that network. And uh, we're doing, you know, we're doing the podcast, obviously, with the Believe Network supporting me here. Um, They're doing great work and just strengthening ties, uh, talking about ideas and stressing that. But obviously, I told them, listen, I got a 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time live chat to get to. And we're getting to it. Right. Uh, So here we are. And Mark, thanks for coming back. Joel says these promotions look and feel really embarrassing to quiet the masses. Yeah, Joel, it's like, it's like, how do they not understand that people can see what it is because the offense was terrible. So why would you give anybody associated with the offense a promotion? Right. It's so, it's so silly. Joel says, what's your take on hiring on Dallas hiring Mike Zimmer as their defensive coordinator was a good defensive coordinator when he was with Cincinnati. Well, I mean, anything but Ron Rivera, like, and listen, Ron Rivera is very, very, very well respected. He's a good guy. Um, You know, you won't find a single person to say a bad thing about Ron Rivera. Like that's, that's just a fact. But that said, um, I think the fact that he hasn't been calling a defense, he had Jack Del Rio calling his defense, the idea that Rivera, who was really the name that was getting even hotter than Zimmer's early on in this process, seemed crazy to me. Um, so if you're comparing those two, you know, I, I think Zimmer's the higher there. Now, um, frankly, I think Martindale could have been the play there. And I think that would have been interesting. But um, Zimmer was somebody, he has connections there and uh, has pedigree, is a good defensive coach. Um, You know, will be a challenge for teams in the division that he's there. He's a good coach. Jim says it's cynical pack, but it's a business. I would be very upset if I were Kafka, if they took play calling away and Jim, that's why he's getting the promotion. Cause if they're doing that, they got to give him something back. That's the way I see it. Jackie Chan and why says, Oh, line sad to say right tackle is a bust. Oh, Evan Neal. Yeah. So you're saying Evan Neal is a bust. Yeah. I mean, I think they have to address that position. I've said before, I think Jermaine Elamanor from the Raiders with Carmen Brasillo ties coming to the giants makes sense maybe as a stopgap while you try to work Evan Neal back in there. But you also know he's probably not going to be the guy and you're trying to move him over to guard. Michael Knight says, let's be honest, Pat, this is probably Dable's last year with the Giants. You're correct. You are, you know, that I agree with, I agree with you that that's likely. Yes. Timothy says, hey, Pat, should Brian Dable and Shane Bowen switch the Giants defense from base 3-4 to base 4-3 next season? Um, well, you know, I would say this, Timothy, that's a really good question. Um, one thing that's interesting, I think is a misconception is like the three, four, four, three is an interesting question, right? Because it does involve like, do you need an extra inside linebacker for a four, three, that type of deal, that type of deal. But Jackie Chan and why, thank you for saying great stuff. I appreciate that. It was a good question by you too. A good comment. Um, but Timothy, I would say this, the three, four, four, three base alignment, like base defense is teams are playing less base defense than ever. And so, you know, the three, four, four, three is a little overrated now, not that it doesn't mean anything, but it is a little bit overrated when it comes to what should you run now, where it does matter is like Dexter Lawrence being the nose over the center. Um, Kayvon Thibodeau, is he standing up, hand in the dirt? Like those those types of things, right? So if there are some key players on your team who you feel will bet it, will benefit from uh, a certain a certain scheme change, then you start thinking about maybe that. But the 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 idea that a switch to a 4-3 th- would change everything or the 3-4 would change everything, there's a lot of uh, sub packages with, you know, a nickel corner on the field instead of that extra linebacker or extra down lineman or whatever it is. 
uh, pass rusher. Like there's a lot of that now in this pass heavy NFL where it's not as big of a deal of whether it's a base three, four or four, three. Joel says, are you locked up in an attic? <laughs> so, so have you guys, has anyone here ever stayed at the Luxor hotel in Vegas? Because it's a pyramid, right? And so right here is the outside wall of the hotel, right? So my room, the hallway walking into my room, you can like look over the, over the wall and see out into the middle of the entire casino. And then you go into your room and then this is the outside of the hotel that's slanted down like a pyramid. So if I open these shades and I looked out that way, I can see Allegiant Stadium Stadium right across the highway. So yes, I'm in the hotel. Part of the reason I set up in the hotel as well, guys, is because um, Radio Row's internet connections apparently are very bad. And so the internet in my hotel was working well. And I said, that's it. That's it. Like that, we're going to do it in the hotel. I'm not risking it. I want to, I want to get to the people, right? All right. So let's go to Rick says, how aggressive do you think Shane will be with creating cap space via contractor structures? Does he touch either the Jones or Waller contract? Yeah. I saw Dan Duggan writing about that. Dan does a really good job with the cap. Um, I think, I think touching Daniel's contract again, touching Waller's contract, those are a little bit dangerous. I do think you touch some other contracts. Like I think Dan mentioned maybe like Andrew and Dexter because those are guys who are going to be on the team for a long time. That makes sense to me. One thing I think is uh, needs to be said is I see fans reacting today to Dan's story saying, oh no, like, are we going to restructure contracts and push more money into the future? Like we said, we weren't going to, but they already did that this past year. Like Shane and the giants did start accelerating the process to try to win. They already did like Bobby O'Karake and Jones's original contract signed this spring. I think by before the season even started, they got restructured to, to free some space. I mean, Ashawn Robinson signed essentially a one-year deal with like four void years on it. So the Giants have already started doing that last year. Like that's part of the disaster of last year, Rick. Um, so Giants are in a tough spot right now. Hunter says Riverboat Ron needs to hang up the headset. I don't disagree. Mark says, I understand the optics aspect, but could you see the new Kafka duties as making better use of his talents because of others' interest in him as a head coach? Same with Tierney, so Dable could be more hands-on. Yes, that's possible, Mark. Um, I definitely think that Kafka is clearly on a track because of the respect he carries around the league and his connections, and he's interviewed well. I think all of those things are, um, you know, he has some leverage here. Uh, Tierney is very close with Dable. Dable's trying to keep, continue to move Shea up. Shea is doing a lot of hard work to get there. Uh, the Chamonix High School, right down the road from my high school, Holy Ghost Prep, um, in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. Um, the Chamonix there in Langhorn. I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, but from you know from the same area. Um, so I hope Shea continues to climb. Um, but Mark, yeah, I think I think obviously Joe Shane's involved in these kind of things. Hopefully, ownership is involved in these kind of things. Though obviously, ownership let let all of this just explode. Um, you know, at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, I think. Listen, the the organization from top down is going to try to do the best that they can to form a winning product on the field. That's what they're always trying to do. But obviously, personalities can get in the way. Uh, incompetence can get in the way, bad personnel can get in the way, bad game management can get in the way. I think a lot of Dable's issues revolved around game days, around how he handled game days. Um, so we'll see if that changes. We'll see if Kafka and Shea and what they do can apply in a more efficient way to games. Thank you, Jackie. Appreciate it, man. Rick says, was Joel Thomas hired to manage a two-back attack like the backfields he oversaw in New Orleans? Rick, I don't know that. Find out an answer to that. That's a good question. I'm actually going to make a note of that right now. All 
I do know that there's a lot of respect in the league for him. As far as all the hirings that the Giants made this offseason, I think that was the one that a lot of people said. Good coach, like right away. Good coach. Does Saquon stay or go? We need an angry runner like Aaron Jones, says Todd. I think Saquon plays elsewhere next year. Um, I don't think they're going to franchise tag him. And I believe that um, the Giants will likely make an offer to him. But I think at least one team will be out there willing to pay him more. And Saquon does want to win. So it's not that he want, he doesn't want to look like he's leaving New York, but he, he does want to win. Hunter says, how come you're not the, at the award ceremony? Um, I think when you apply for that credential, you end up sitting in like a media room and I mean, you can do the red carpet. That's interesting, but you end up, uh, kind of barricaded in and boxed in and confined, if that makes sense. And, um, I'd rather mingle and bounce around and frankly, Hunter, and, uh, you know, I have confidence in my ability to, uh, get to it with the stories where they are and not need to go there in order to be fed one. If that makes sense. Jackie says the, uh, the Giants are always, always messing the cap up. Mara needs to go away. Joel says how much caps. Uh, I will say this, Jackie. I want to hear from John Mara. I, I do want to hear from him. Joel says how much cap space do you think we'll end up having before free agency starts? I see them moving Dex and Andrew's money down the road. Um. I don't know exactly how much they're going to end up with. I know they have, they're starting with like 21. So can they kick up, up to around 30 or into the thirties? Maybe Um, I have to do the exact math on that. Um, But I know the way it's shaping up is for them to make one or two targeted signings, like key, you know, let's spend the money for this player signings. But remember, you know, you got a draft class. Now you have – when you have high picks like this, it's good, but you got to pay them, right? So I know they're rookies, and so they're cheaper. But with a first and two seconds, if you use all those picks, like you got to have money left over to pay those rookies and all those things. So uh, free agency is going to be one or two targeted guys, you know, maybe like two targeted signings and then filling in the rest plus the draft class. Jackie says, how likely is New York to trade up? For J- Jaden Daniels, quarterback from LSU, is he legit? Um, have heard that I need to do my homework on everything surrounding Jaden, the people around him, those kind of things. Very talented, obviously, has proven a lot of people wrong in the last couple of years. Um, I still think it's more likely the Giants take a, uh, a wide receiver at six. Obviously, their offensive line has to improve as well. But they are in the quarterback market. There's no question about it. Michael says, uh, oh, Jackie, I also think Joe Shane would make all the calls to try to trade up. I'm just not sure if he's going to find find one. We'll see. Do you think it's possible when Coach Dable gets fired, Mike Kafka will take over as head coach, does Michael? Um, I guess with him receiving this new title, it's possible that he would become the interim head coach for the remainder remainder of this season if Dable got fired. If Dable gets fired next year, though, and they go into the end of the season, and the listen, if Dable gets fired during the season or at the end of the season, it's going to mean that the offense was terrible. So you'll basically have like two and a half seasons of bad offense with Kafka and Dable attached to it. I don't know why he would become the head coach there. So um, I think Kafka now is in line to become the interim head coach if Dable gets fired mid-year. Joe Winograd says, do you have a sense of what the Giants think the problem was with their offense this past year? A lot of fans with a lot of opinions, but at the end of the day, what management thinks is what matters. Um, Joe, I think I think they blame injuries, which to me is a little frustrating because I think they need to take accountability for those injuries rather than blaming them on anybody, like other than their soft practice schedule, the players they acquired, you know, Darren Waller, et cetera, whatever. But like, you know, 
I don't think that's an excuse. I think the offensive line was worse than just injuries. I think the plan for it was bad. The personnel ideas were bad. The draft picks in 2022 were bad there. So, Joe, I have to admit, running back Daniel Jones, thinking injuries was a huge part of the offensive line, uh, you know, scares me. Scares me. Not feeling necessarily like they have to pay Saquon, maybe. I don't know. Todd says, shouldn't our starters play during the preseason every year? It's like we are not prepared the first few games. Todd, yes. I mean, listen, there are some teams who rest guys and have a certain way of doing things, and it works. It hasn't worked for the Giants. Guys get hurt, and the team's not ready to play. Like, they were not ready to play that Dallas game, right? Like, the Giants team was not ready to play a football game against the Cowboys in week one last year. There is no question about it. No debate. That's not my opinion. It's a fact, right? So they need to change the way they run training camp. Absolutely. I don't know about how much they play in the preseason. Like, to be honest, Todd, like, I think if their training camp is harder and more serious and, like, you know, a, more of a grind, I think that, um, you know, maybe not necessarily playing in the games, but definitely getting in that work. Um, not Not going soft. See, Playboy Phil, what's up, Phil? He says, if it's true the Giants want to keep Daniel Jones, then Joe and Dable need to go because they've been around a top two quarterback in the league and Daniel Jones isn't that. And if they get nothing for Saquon and don't take a quarterback, they definitely got to go. I do think they're taking a quarterback, Phil. I I know I saw Matt Miller, who I really respect, saying that he thinks they're going to sign a veteran QB and stick with Daniel. Like, listen, Joe Shane took this job thinking he was going to draft a quarterback. Like, I know he paid Daniel Jones, but man, oh, man. Like, to me, I you know, he's made some mistakes, but I think he's smart enough to know he's got to, he's got to try to find a succession plan. Obviously, maybe there becomes a tug of war between ownership and the GM and the coach or whatever. But I don't know. I, you know, I think the GM and the coach know that they need to draft a quarterback personally. That's what I think. It's all, but I, but Phil, Phil, I also agree that like Dable is not the only one under pressure this year, in my opinion. Like I think Shane is under pressure this year, depending on how things go. I don't know what will happen. You know, the giant, the GM position in New York is typically sacred, but well, I will see. Hunter says it's all confusing to me. You couldn't have a good offense with an elite running back. Now you're going to have a rookie or an underperforming back. It's not getting any easier. So same OC at head coach. Yeah, uh, Hunter, I wish I could sell you a better version of the Giants, but I can't right now. You make a good point. Rick says, what is your sense of what Ryan Cowden is doing and what is his influence compared to Brandon Browns? Well, this is this is interesting, Rick. I can tell you this. I heard the other day that, like, they thought Brandon Brown was getting the job in, with the Chargers, and he didn't. Um, you know, I think – that's that's interesting to me. Um, Cowden definitely seems like he has some influence with, um, you know, with all the Titans assistants coming on board. A lot of a lot of ties to him, um, you know. But I can tell you that I can tell you that 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 Brandon Brown's chances at the uh, Chargers job was real, and so I don't know. Maybe maybe during that process. Cowden's voice is growing a little louder. He and Shane are definitely good friends. Uh, they're close. Like I said, you know, raiding the Titans coaching staff scares me a little. Bowen, though, does come with some good things. So, see. Um, good question, Rick. Rick, I do think it, it indicates Joe Shane continuing to, you know, this is Joe Shane's show. Like, it's a continuing uh, development or reinforcement of that. Antonio says, what's going on, Pat, a little late? Well, Antonio, I think what I outlined for the offseason was I'm going to try to do Mondays at noon and Thursdays at 9 p.m. Um, you know, and then the idea being that the Thursday chat keeps us consistent for the regular season when I do the Thursday halftime live chat. So that's my idea there. Jay Fed says, if three quarterbacks go before six, Giants are drafting a QB, in my opinion. I don't think Giants are trading up for one. I agree with you, Jay Fed. I still think they draft one in the first or second round. 
as I sit here right now. I reserve the right to change that, but I just don't think I just don't think either of these guys are going to lose their job and say like the only quarterback we ever had was Daniel Jones with the Giants. Like I don't think they're going to do it. Antonio says, "Do you expect Deshaun Robinson to be resigned?" I don't know about that. I mean. Antonio, the one thing is Ashawn comes with like dead cat money for the next three years. Like it's not, it's not crazy every year, but he does come with some dead cat money because of the void years. So I don't know. I just, it looks like the type of player that they have to bring back based on his contract. Hunter says, what is the cap hit on a Xavier franchise tag? It's like, oh my God, it's like, it's unsustainable. I mean, he... I can tell you exactly right now. So the franchise tags per overthecap.com, okay? And by the way, I know there's a lot of different cap sites. Over the cap is the one. The safety cap hit for franchise tag is $17.2 million. Like that is that is crazy. Crazy. I'm not saying McKinney's a good player, obviously, but that's just, wow. You know, that's a lot of money to give one player. So that's why if they kept McKinney, it would just be a it would just be a contract. It would be a contract where they could pay him a certain number and then kick some money out into the following years. Yeah, J Fed says I can see drafting a second or a third, a quarterback, or late first, J Fed, like trading up in the late first. Um, you know, is JJ McCarthy a guy that they would take at six or they could trade back and get him at nine or ten, Bo Nix, whatever. I'm not saying I love those guys, I'm just saying. If Shane and Dayball are under pressure from ownership, how do they deal with a director of personnel who is an owner, says Rick? Yeah, Tim McDonald's a part of the process. Uh, Joe Shane and he communicate frequently. Um, that's just a that's just a part of what the Giants – that's a part of working for the Giants. Um, you know, Tim's a part of the personnel department, and he's uh, he has some say-so, but, it, you know, it's Joe's show. It's Joe, it's Joe Shane's show. What is McKinney's market on the open market? Well, the safety market last year was saturated and extremely disappointing for the safeties on the market. And um, McKinney is a good player. I do think it'll be interesting to see if he does hit the market, what he would get. I do think, um, here, you know, it's interesting. Saquon's the guy who would love to stay in New York and just have them pay him. I think McKinney would... Not that he doesn't love the Giants. He does love the Giants in New York, whatever. But, like, I think he would love to be validated as the player he believes he is and pay top dollar, even if it was not in New York. That That's me speculating based on dealing with these guys. It's not That's not anything he told me, like, yesterday or anything like that. That's just me talking. But, you know, I always say this about the Giants and about teams in general. You don't just get rid of bad uh, – you don't just get rid of good players. Like you don't, you don't do that. If you have a good player, you try to keep him. Michael says, to be honest, I'm not crazy about any of these quarterbacks in the draft. I worry if they can handle New York. Hmm. Interesting. Antonio says, do you think running back Devin Singletary could be a free agency target if they let Saquon go to get a cheap veteran back that has a connection with Dayball and Shane? Antonio, I would normally say yes, except when Singletary was Dable's running back, he never gave him the ball, right? Like, Dable never ran the ball with Devin Singletary. Now you could say, well, if he comes to the Giants, then they can just throw the ball all the time and not run the ball. And that's what Dable wants to do. Except we all know that Daniel Jones had a lot of success with a run heavy offense and him running the ball. So I don't know if that's the right way to go. Guys, this has been great. Thank you so much for being loyal followers and listeners. Again, talking ball with Pat Leonard, uh, Believe Network. Responsored by Bet Online, responsored by Estate 98 Coffee. It's an Essencia de Cafe from El Salvador, dates back to 1798. Um, hopefully, I gave you some intel on Shane Bowen. You can go and read what I wrote on the New York Daily News website about Bowen and his fit with the Giants and the transition away from Martindale as well. Um, instead of doing a post game from the Super Bowl from the stadium, let's do a Monday um, noon Eastern. Live chat. So again, Mondays at noon, Thursdays at 9 p.m. That's going to be our off-season schedule. If you missed parts of this, you can watch it back here on YouTube or go on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen. I'm sure you're listening right now, too. If you're just listening back, try to catch a couple nuggets from what we got. 
Uh, ran into Golden Tate, by the way, at uh, on Radio Row. He's playing a lot of pickleball. Looks good. Looks like he's in great shape. Looks like he can still play in the NFL. Michael Knight says, any chance we can hear you on FAN in the future? I did a podcast with Sal Licata right after the story I wrote on Wink Martindale, Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, and all that. Um, would love to go on FAN sometime again soon. And then keep hitting them up. Tell them you want me on there, and I'll jump on there as well. Thank you so much for being loyal followers and listeners, guys. Rick, Hunter, uh, Michael, Jackie Chan, great insight today. Uh, and thanks for the compliments. We will see you next time on the Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard podcast and live chat. See you later, guys.